Growing up in Detroit in the 80s, Lee Iacocca was king. He was the quintessential businessman that could do no wrong. I'm so happy to be able to bring you this video on his life and his influence on both Ford and Chrysler. I hope you enjoy it. Everything you see here is my own work. Enjoy. In 1929, near a steel factory in Allentown, a five-year-old boy enters his kindergarten classroom. He is Italian and all the kids are Pennsylvania Dutch. When asked his name, the boy responded in a heavy accent, Lido. The kids laughed. Little did anyone know that one day, this little Italian boy would revolutionize the automobile industry. Fast forward 30 years later, and Lido, now Lee Iacocca, was changing the automobile industry by creating the Ford Mustang, the car that defined generations. This is the story of how a poor immigrant son revolutionized the auto industry and became president of two of the world's largest corporations. 1919. The story begins in San Marco, Italy, when a young couple make their way to America. Nicola Iacocca and Antoinetta Perota came to America by boat, past the Statue of Liberty into the New York Harbor. Like many immigrants, Lady Liberty presented a chance for a better life and a chance for their family to find success in the new world. They made their way to the hard-working Rust Belt town, where Nicola worked three jobs as a theater usher, a shoe cobbler, and a hot dog vendor. Antoinetta was always enamored with automobiles and worked for a car rental service. In 1924, their son Lido Anthony Iacocca was born. As Lido grew up, school became a happy place. He was a good student, well-liked, and took it upon himself to participate in nearly every extracurricular activity, even if he wasn't the most gifted athlete. Despite his diligent efforts at school, Lido graduated 12th in a class of 900 but his father had higher expectations. He was so upset, why didn't you come in first? You hear my father describe it, you'd think I'd flunked. It was these early experiences that set high expectations for Lee Iacocca, who knew he couldn't just get by on being ordinary. It's 1941 and the world is at war. By now, Iacocca prided himself as a full-blooded American and was proud to do his patriotic duty. However, due to a history of rheumatic fever as a child, the military turned him down. He was devastated. Being sidelined by the army for a medical reason was a disgrace to Lee. He once again started to think of himself as a second-class citizen, feeling like the only young man in America who wasn't built for combat. So Lee worked on refining his mind. In 1942, Iacocca enrolled in engineering at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. As more young men were drafted, the class sizes in Lehigh became smaller and smaller until Lee Iacocca received almost an exclusive college education. By senior year, he moved away from studying hydraulics and thermodynamics, switching to business courses like labor problems, statistics, and accounting. Not only did he perform better in these subjects, but the combination of engineering and business became the very thing to spell his future success. In addition to all the engineering and business courses, I also studied four years of psychology and abnormal psychology at Lehigh. I've applied more of those courses in dealing with the nuts I've met in the corporate world than all the engineering courses in dealing with the nuts and bolts of automobiles. Lee shared his mother's love of automobiles, and he always knew he wanted to work at Ford. He drove a beat-up 1938 60-horsepower Ford, which was where he found his love for the company. As luck would have it, when he was finishing his master's degree at Princeton, he was hired to come work for Ford when he graduated. 1946. Iacocca originally joined Ford Motors as an engineer, earning just $5 a week. But with his talents in business and a gift of persuasion, he was soon transferred to the sales and marketing divisions where his career flourished. Driven by his father's constant desire for him to be the best and armed with his formal education, Lee excelled in all aspects at Ford. His first major recognition came from his 56 for 56 campaign. The campaign offered loans on the 1956 model year car with a 20% down payment and $56 monthly installments for three years. It was a raging success, taking Iacocca to the Dearborn, Michigan headquarters. In just four short years, at age 36, Lee elevated himself from sales to vice president and general manager of the Ford division. The year, 1964. During his time climbing the corporate ladder, Iacocca designed several successful Ford cars, but the one that changed his trajectory in life was the iconic Ford Mustang. Seeing the need for an affordable and trendy sports car among the baby boomer generation, Iacocca tasked product advisor Hal Spurlick 
and stylist Gail Halderman to design what was first called the Cougar. After convincing the board, and most importantly Henry Ford Jr. to build it, the project was greenlit, mainly thanks to Iacocca's natural talent for sales. It wasn't without its obstacles, however. With a shoestring budget and just 18 months to develop it, Iacocca went full steam ahead. Against all odds, they made the Cougar in time and changed its name to Mustang after the World War II fighter jet P-51 Mustang. The first Mustang ever made was a two-seat, mid-mounted engine roadster, and it employed the German Ford Taunus V4 engine. The car that went public was the 1963 Mustang II four-seater concept, hitting the World's Fair in 1964 to a hot audience. The night before this launch, Ford ran Mustang commercials on all three of the television networks. And the next day, it ran huge one-page ads in over 2,500 newspapers. Ford also placed Mustangs in lobbies of several Holiday Inns and airports and took out billboards in over 170 markets. This was Iacocca's most significant project yet, and the marketing had to be perfect. And it was. In fact, car dealers were taken aback by the lengths some buyers went to get a Mustang in their driveway. From one person sleeping in a car until the down payment cleared so Ford wouldn't take the car from under him, to a dealer having to lock his doors to keep mobs of people out of his showroom. It's been reported that over four million people crammed into Ford showrooms just to peek at the Mustang. Iacocca predicted it would sell 100,000 units a year, but the Mustang blew away all expectations by selling 400,000 in the first year alone. The one millionth Mustang was sold within just two years of launch, landing Lee Iacocca on the covers of Time and Newsweek magazine. Because of his enthusiasm, finance, and engineering skills, Iacocca had been involved in every aspect of the car, and by 1970, he was named president of Ford Motors, earning almost one million dollars a year, and the reputation of being the world's greatest salesman in U.S. history. Following his unprecedented success with the Ford Mustang, Lee decided to quickly turn his attention to other projects. In 1968, in response to the need for a domestically produced compact and fuel-efficient vehicle, Iacocca began working on his follow-up to the Mustang, the Pinto. Iacocca wanted the Pinto to weigh less than 2,000 pounds and cost less than $2,000. He was the driving force behind the production of the Ford Pinto, but in 1977, it seemed his Midas touch had faded. Iacocca faced allegations that the car's structural design allowed the fuel tank filler neck to break off, puncturing the fuel tank in the event of a rear-end collision and causing a fire. This became an example of bad cost-benefit analysis and engineering ethics, and the cars were recalled for added reinforcements and safety shielding. It was his greatest failure, and it seemed anyone who was envious of Iacocca's early success were now reveling in his recent failure. Mistakes are a part of life. You can't avoid them. All you can hope is that they won't be too expensive and that you don't make the same mistake twice. During this time, as Iacocca was on track to becoming CEO, he was also clashing with Henry Ford Jr. Behind closed doors, corporate struggles were bubbling up to the surface, and in 1978, despite a record high valuation, Henry Ford Jr. fired Lee as president of the Ford Motor Company. Many stakeholders were against it, but the die was cast. I wanted to force him to give me a reason, because I knew he didn't have a good one. Finally, he just shrugged his shoulders and said, well, sometimes you just don't like somebody. Iacocca was devastated. He had put his heart and soul into Ford and loved it as long as he could remember. Ford was the only life he knew, and it was a public, embarrassing failure. But there was something Iacocca didn't count on. While he was pouring his life into Ford, other companies had taken notice of his achievements. Iacocca started receiving offers from companies all over the world. Though he had made enough to retire and play golf for the rest of his life, he didn't want that. He wanted to work. 1978. As if by luck, barely one year later, Chrysler came knocking on Iacocca's door. It seemed perfect, except for one thing. Chrysler was on the verge of bankruptcy. The day I came on board, the company had announced a third quarter loss of almost $160 million, the worst deficit in its history. There was no real committee set up, no organizational chart, no system of meetings to get people talking to each other. I took one look at that system and I almost threw up. That's when I knew I was in really deep trouble. Iacocca was more interested in solving the problem than making money, so he did something no CEO has ever done. He reduced his salary to only $1 a year. Once that was done, he got to work sorting out the managerial chaos. He identified the company's strong points, hired some executives he knew from Ford, and restored good faith among consumers by establishing good PR practices. 
It was definitely a change, but it wasn't impactful enough to save the company. So Lee did something no one had thought to do, because it felt like too crazy an idea. 1979. With Chrysler's debts and woes mounting, and the possibility of a shutdown looming, Lee approached the U.S. Congress to lobby for a $1.5 billion loan guarantee from the federal government. Chrysler has a strong future. We're ready to move forward. In return, Chrysler would reduce their costs by $2 billion and abandon any projects that weren't showing enough promise. It was controversial for the federal government to support a car company or any American business at the time, but Lee Iacocca worked tirelessly to make it happen. He even enlisted the help of Chrysler dealers from around America to lobby their local representatives and praise their collective efforts in turning Chrysler around, saying, I was the general in a war to save Chrysler, but I sure didn't do it alone. What I'm most proud of is the coalition I was able to put together. It shows what cooperation can do for you in hard times. To improve things, Lee focused his efforts solely on what he knew would work. Chrysler released the first K-Car line, the Dodge Aries and the Plymouth Reliant, in 1981. Iacocca even worked on producing some of the designs rejected by Ford earlier, which resembled the minivan. Sure enough, when Chrysler released the minivan in 1983, the product led auto industry sales for 25 years. Because of the K-Cars and minivans, and along with the reforms Iacocca implemented, Chrysler turned around quickly, and it was able to repay the government-backed loans seven years earlier than expected. In 1984, Chrysler posted profits of $2.4 billion, the largest ever in the company's 60-year history. Following this success, Iacocca enabled Chrysler's acquisition of AMC, which also brought the highly profitable Jeep division under them. Throughout his time at Chrysler, with help from advertising executive Leo Arthur Kelmanson, Lee appeared in a series of commercials employing the ad campaign, The Pride is Back, to show the comeback of Chrysler. He also became well known for his trademark phrase, if you can find a better car, buy it. If you can find a better car, buy it. Lee Iacocca had become a rare corporate public figure and a symbol of success and good old-fashioned know-how. He led the company in his trailblazing, innovative, no-nonsense manner until his retirement. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan approached Iacocca with the request to head a private sector effort to raise funds for the restoration and preservation of the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island and thus the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation was created. Americans poured in hundreds of millions of dollars to repair, restore, and maintain the two greatest monuments in the country, and the venture was a huge success. All funds of the project came from the American people with zero government assistance. Iacocca had come full circle since his parents had arrived in the New York Harbor, and he was living proof of the American dream. Though he retired from Chrysler in 1992, it didn't stop Iacocca from actively pursuing other ventures. In a cover story with Fortune magazine, he famously said, I flunked retirement. There's no better way to put it. Iacocca founded Olivio Premium Products that year, and its signature product was an olive oil-based margarine product. And needless to say, he appeared in his own commercials. Iacocca authored a few books, starting with his autobiography, which became a bestseller in the nonfiction category. He gave all proceeds from the book to type 1 diabetes research. Through his later years, Iacocca continued to feature in commercials, even making one with Snoop Dogg. If the ride is more fly, then you must buy. That's what I hear. And finally, being an advocate for education, and as a tribute to his former college, Iacocca led the fundraising campaign to enable Lehigh University to adapt and use vacant buildings on the campus formerly owned by the Bethlehem Steel. Today, those structures house the Iacocca Institute, focused on competing on a global level. Lee Iacocca loved nothing more than a challenge. He seemed most comfortable in a war room, fixing the unfixable, creating and innovating against all odds, and standing up to displays of power when it made no sense. He's a true example of a man who began with nothing and refined himself through extensive education and practice to become a catalyst of change in the auto industry. He died in 2019 at the age of 94, leaving behind an incredible legacy and valuable life lessons. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to the channel for similar content and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video. Thanks for watching.